Hello. Hello. That's right. It is YouTube time this time all the time. If you like poetry, if you like literature, if you like cultural history, then you've come to the right place. We make podcasts about all of those things. So be sure to like and share this video. And of course, most importantly, subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. Since we mostly make podcasts, you can also find our shows on all the major podcast platforms. So if you found this video, but YouTube isn't your speed for regular podcast listening, head over to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe there. All right. Hope you enjoy the episode. Hello, I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and welcome to this belated episode of Close Talking. Today we are revisiting one of our older episodes. In this one, Connor and I talked about one of my personal favorite poems, Emily Dickinson's To Make a Prairie. It's this beautiful short poem. I probably reference it in day-to-day -day life more than almost any other work, because even though it's barely 30 words long, uh, and many of those words repeat themselves, it's full of all kinds of really cool meaning, and Connor and I definitely dig into that. Before we get to that, however, just very quickly, a reminder that if you like what you hear on the show, it would mean the world to me, and I know he's not here, but I feel safe speaking for Connor on this one, uh, when I say it would mean the world to him too, if you hopped over to the iTunes store and left us a rating and a review, because those ratings and reviews are the best way to help us climb up the old iTunes algorithm and find new listeners. All right, on with the show. Oh, welcome to a brand new episode of Close Talking. I am Connor McNamara Stratton. And I'm Jack Rossiter Munley. And this... Well, I already said, it's close talking. Uh, it we close talk talking. about poems, we read it, we talk about it, we read it again. We got a great poem for for you. We got a, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> oh, we got a great <laughs> poem for you. We've got a great poem today. Jack is going to tell you all about it. Yes, today we have a poem that I chose. It is technically untitled because it's by Emily Dickinson. Uh, the actual, yeah, no kidding. Uh, Emily Dickinson, all of the, an American yeah. classic poet. Uh, yeah, so her poems are pretty much all untitled in actuality, but the common practice was that they were given the title that is their first line or part of their first line. So this poem is commonly known as To Make a Prairie. A quick programming note before we get into the meat of our conversation. <laughs> As a matter of practice, most of our podcasts, in fact, all of our podcasts to date, have been dedicated to the incomparable Sarita. Because why wouldn't they be? She's the Today's, best. Today's, we have to add a caveat, and that is that po uh, close-talking podcasts are dedicated to Sarita unless otherwise noted. And today, it must be otherwise noted because today's poem is by Emily Dickinson. And I happen to live with an incomparable cat who bears that same name. She is 17 years old, almost, and perfect in literally every way. And so today's podcast is dedicated to the cat Emily Dickinson. She's a feline nonpareil. It is true. You have no idea, dear listener, how many times her, let's call them contributions, have been cut out of episodes of Close Talking. That's, that's a fact. Emily Dickinson, the poet, was born in 1830 and passed away in 1886 before she had her birthday, so at the age of 55. She wrote 1,800 poems in her life, of which only 10 were published during her lifetime, and I believe none of which, when they were published, had her name attached to them. She was very intensely private about her poems. One of my favorite moments in all of Wishbone, an incredible series, is in an episode that actually has nothing to do with poetry. It's just sort of part of the contemporary day story that reminds Wishbone of literature. And all of the main characters are sitting around studying for a poetry pop quiz that they're going to get the next day, and they're all mad about it. 
and one of them reads out, I'm nobody, who are you? Are you nobody too? And they need to guess the poet and everybody's struggling with it. And Wishbone says, I'll give you a hint. This poet lived in Amherst, Massachusetts and didn't get out much. And that <laughs> is a pretty pithy way to let you know it's Emily Dickinson. She did spend almost her entire life in Amherst, Massachusetts. And as her life went on, she left her house less and less. There is a famous image of her as this woman in white. She wore a lot of white. For her, it was the color of passion. So not virginal white, but it was like this intense, burning white passion of the soul kind of thing. Uh, so enshrouded in passionate white. And through the course of her life, she did retreat more and more into her room, but she kept up a vibrant correspondence with leading thinkers of the day. So the idea of her as being cut off from the world, this ethereal female poet figure sort of not connected to the events of the day is just not true. Um, she did some pretty quirky things like she didn't, you know, famously she stayed in her room during her dad's funeral when it was happening downstairs. She would often receive guests from the other side of a closed door for, you know, reasons. She's Emily Dickinson. She can do what she wants. But she did lead a life that was mainly uh, in the house, but she read widely and she was very connected to ideas, the world around her, and to what she called the, I forget the exact term she uses, but she had the very strong sense of uh, interiority and the landscape within oneself. And so I think as much as she was connected to the world of earthly ideas, she was also uh, an explorer of her own inner country as well. And yeah, she wrote most of her poems pretty early in her life uh, and her most prolific period, which I think just by association sort of connects to the idea that she was strongly influenced by the world around her. She wrote about 800 of her poems during the years of the Civil War. Wow. And I don't think that's totally a coincidence. They're not about the Civil War. But I think what was going on in the country probably energized her. I mean, it's also the years when she was in her prime of life as well. But at the same time, to have that much creative output in such a short period of time, she wrote almost 400 poems one year. Like, it's it's crazy amounts of, of writing. I think that sort of goes to it. And there's a massive amount of scholarship about Emily Dickinson. If you want to learn about her, don't listen to me. I'm not an expert on her. I just happen to like her poetry a lot and have an interest. There are great books, great resources. Go to them. All of this is a long way to say she is an American classic. An American classic. And today's poem is by her. So let's get to the poem. I'm glad the introduction was that long because wait till you hear this poem. <laughs> This is To Make a Prairie. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee, and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. And that's the poem. That's the whole poem. <laughs> it's so good. It makes my heart swell with great joy. It is 27 words long, and it's so good. Yes. You said this is one of your favorites. It Tell is, me. It, this, it's one of my favorites. Um, very quickly, uh, there is a number sometimes associated with this poem. If you look it up on, I think, the Academy of American, Academy of American Poets website, it's 1755. In the first complete collection of Emily Dickinson's poems, the poems were all numbered. And so this is poem number 1755. It doesn't correspond to a year or something like that. Um, that is the Johnson publication of her poems. It was the first one that contained them all. There was a subsequent edition that was put out. The number associated with this poem and that one is 1779. That's the Franklin edition. And that edition was by this guy who actually went through all of her handwritten poems and attempted to put them into chronological order. Because when, after she had died, 40 of these little hand-stitched volumes that she'd made over the course of her life were discovered that contained her full, like, 1,800 poems. And so this guy went through and tried to figure out what the chronological order of the poems was. So this is, as best as he could tell, this would be poem number 1779 of Emily Dickinson's poems. There are and, also envelope poems that have been discovered 
that you can find in museums somewhere, but she wrote, and they've published a book that tries to recreate it, but she wrote poems on envelopes and maybe other things. Um, and that's really all I know about it, but it's apparently, it's cool. She wrote poems on all kinds of stuff. She wrote them on candy wrappers, envelopes, scraps of ephemera that would come into her life all, all over the place. Um, uh, but yeah, this is one of my favorite poems because it's not necessarily because it's short, but because it is such a short, sweet, in many ways, hopeful poem. I just really enjoy the message that initially something big can come from something small, but that in the end, just the desire and interest in something big can bring that into being. And that desire or that uh, idea can be enough to, to push it into existence or to, to call it up, even if it's just for yourself in your own mind. It's, it begins the act of creation, which I just think is really a neat idea that, that she's playing with in this poem. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love, I love it too. Um, I had not read it until you sent it to me, and then I was like, Dick, nap it, what am I doing? Um, I love this. I immediately committed it to memory and danced about the room. Um, I love the fact, yeah, that you do talk about the small, making something big out of something small, and then um, actually just having the desire how that plays out in the poem is so funny. Um, so to make a prairie is this prairie acts as the the big thing, the big field of whatever joy or opportunity or something um, or just beauty. Um, it takes one, a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee, um, and then so it's like Just in case you were confused about the number of clovers and bees, <laughs> it's, it's one of each. <laughs> one of each. Just one. A clover oh. and one bee, one clover and a bee. Just don't mess it up. One of each. Get it right. But it's so funny. I mean, that's so funny. But also it's perfect because it's like, it's when when you say small, it's like, when you like were just yeah, it's like small not a lot of things can make a big thing. But I wouldn't think of exactly two things, one of them being a clover, which is also frickin' tiny, and then a bee. What the F, which obviously you get some like pollination action, so that starts the whole process. But the fact that then it's repeated twice is A hilarious. B perfect because She's like, no, it's just these two things. But then she's like, actually, you just need reverie. First, it's these two things. Then there's this third element. And she's like, ah, you know what? It's probably just that third thing, guys. Yeah. I was kidding about the clovers and bees. And yeah. also, this prairie is like not a physical prairie. It's just the prairie of desire. <laughs> so like, maybe if you dream about stuff, that's a great start. And the prairie can be the prairie of whatever you want to make. Yeah, I just, yeah. And I love the fact, the fact that eventually she's getting to Reverie alone works. It seems like it works in the the poem because she's repeated the two, she's repeated exactly the two small things she thinks initially are required. Like, she could just say, to make a prairie, like, it takes a clover, like, she could write the poem, to make a prairie, it takes a clover, a bee, and reverie. Actually, reverie will do. Or something like that. She would never put in the word actually. But that wouldn't really do the trick, because you wouldn't have lived for a short period of time being like, okay, I need one clover and one bee and reverie. Like, that extra repetition gets that first thought, and then she's like, reverie alone will do. The bees are few, and that that release, I don't know, from the clover and the bee, which was already so small but so exact, is so joyous to read, I think.
And in such a short poem, the fact that she sticks with that clover and a bee, bee and a clover piece of it, I mean, that's like way more than, that's like more than half the words in the poem. It's probably like two thirds of the words of the poem before you get to the reverie. She's holding you in that space, even though it's a short poem, the whole thing goes by quickly. As a percent of poem time, you're held in that space with the clover and the bee for most of the time in the poem. And then reverie comes in and then she doubles down on the reverie, which I think is a neat way that she sort of plays with the whole thing. Um, yeah. It's interesting you bring up alternate ways it could be done because, I mean, obviously she would never have written it this way because it wasn't anywhere close to literary style of the time. But I was thinking of a contemporary sort of take on a poem like this. And I think it would be something like, to make a prairie, it takes clover and bee, clover and bee and reverie. Reverie will do if bees are few. Like it's even fewer words, but it also doesn't give you quite the same feeling, I don't think. I think it's still really effective. And part of what, at least for me, the experiment of doing it that way had the impact of is like, she's really done a good job. The specificity of clover as the choice of botanical object <laughs> is really strong because everybody knows what a clover is, but it's not grass and it's not wheat and it's not anything that you would normally come up with for a prairie. It's this little flower. It will grow all over the damn place, but it's small and distinct. And the word itself is much more evocative than almost any other she could choose that would fill that space. And so when you break it down to just the highlight words that she's picking, it's still a really effective poem, but it doesn't have the same overall feeling of stretching out and then release that she manages to create through her manipulation of, of language and to some extent time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, oh my God, yes, this is what I wanna talk about. Okay, A, yes, clover, great word. Also, so reverie is basically clover and a bee, sonically, in a way. There's, or there's the big parts. So the er part, the V-E-R part of clover, reverie's got, and the E part of B, Reverie's got. So it just works perfectly. They just like make Reverie, clovers and bees, uh, in, your, in your ear, they make it. And Prairie too um, works, it's, it's different, but it's got the R and the E sounds that lead into this Reverie, clover and bee thing that's happening. The other part with time, and, and I was, enjoyed hearing um, your contemporaries felt like a little spoken word uh, poem was it made me think of I've been thinking about like how this poem is laid out line wise which I think is interesting so uh, which I think is important I'll have to I'll say it because our listeners just have their ears this is a very big disadvantage, although you can easily look it up. We will post a link, but anyway, first line is, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. That's the whole first line. Second line, one clover and a bee. And reverie is the third line. So one clover and a bee, second line, and reverie, third line. Fourth line, the reverie alone will do. Last line, if bees are few. So the way that this is broken up, I think, is actually kind of three different parts uh, that are sort of almost five stresses total. The first line is the first part. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. That's got about five stresses. To make a prairie, we have two. Then there's sort of like a, a I think when you say it, you have to pause a little bit because uh, to make a prairie, it takes a, like there's a pause in between prairie and it, because it, you're starting a new phrase, but also the E on prairie is unstressed and the it is unstressed, which is a little awkward. So then 
which will be relevant, I think, to my theory. But um, then it takes a clover and one bee. So takes, I think, is stressed clover, the clove and clover. And then one bee is like what you might call a spondy or something, which is like a Greek term for like two two equal stresses on something. One B is kind of like da da, but I think that occupies one unit or whatever. So that's five. And then the second two lines, I think, occupy the second part, but are broken up. One clover and a B and reverie. I think so, and then then I think the third part, the reverie alone will do if bees are few. But this is interesting. I, I'll start with the last two lines because I think it's clearer. Is the, um, so the last, the fourth line, the reverie alone will do, has I think three stresses. So the reverie, the rev, alone, the own, and then will do. So the reverie alone will do. And then the, set, the last line is two stresses if bees are few. You could put that on the same line and it would be basically the same length as the first line. That was sort of long and a lot of stresses. A long way of saying one thing that's interesting is there's a slight inversion of the phrases and then the fact that the lines are broken in the second and third lines and third and fourth lines are, but not in the first, is an interesting move um, that I think helps extend the time a little bit. I think there's more to say, but I, I'm going to stop talking because I can't hear myself say stress anymore. <laughs> I'm <Does> getting stressed. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, and if anything, this poem is like the opposite of stressful. Ah, it's joyous. In the, in the non-poetic sense. Uh, I think that's interesting, and bringing up the stresses and the line breaks, particularly where Emily Dickinson is concerned, is important because she was very conscious about how she broke up the lines of her poems and how she punctuated her poems. This poem itself doesn't have examples of this, but she's famous for all of the different dashes that she would put in her poems. And when they were first published, a lot of her more quixotic line breaks, word choices, and punctuation were removed and sort of smoothed out for conventions of the time. They've since been added in as best as typography can approximate, which we can all appreciate. But the real point here is that she, as a poet, was really interested in conveying a certain way of reading through her poems. She, in some instances, basically invented punctuation. Like She has these straight up and down slashes that she used that are in lines. It's like, what, what is that? We're not really sure because she never talked to anyone about it during her life and these poems were found when she was already dead. But she was so committed to getting a certain way of having the person who was reading it experience, I guess, the equivalent of sort of the acoustics of a read poem. She wanted to approximate her reading of the poem in the way it was presented that she really was conscious in constructing particularly line breaks and punctuation. And the line breaks in this poem are fascinating. And part of it is how the stresses end up being constructed in it. And part of it is just the fact that like 11 of 27 words are in the first line. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. Yeah. And I think 16 words are in the first two lines before we get to reverie, which is basically the point. And that's the last 11 words in three lines. Like that's a really interesting way to put the poem together because it does, it really does hold you in that, in that top part before it gets you to really the, the heart of what she wants to, to discuss, which is this reverie. Yeah. So precise with her, with her pacing um, and her, her rhyming um, and off rhyming and stuff. Um, and it, it's, I also, I bring that up too in part because the, there's basically also, there's sort of like three ideas in the poem, which are bro like broken up in almost exactly the three, like five stress parts that I talked about. I mean, 
The first part is the first line to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one B. And then the second idea is sort of just a restatement of the idea, but one clover and a bee and reverie. And those, that feels sort of distinct. Um, and then the reverie alone will do if bees are few. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, it's hard to say that the second part is maybe its own idea, quote unquote, but it feels a little bit like it is. Um, and I want to bring attention to, like, I want to try to connect the idea to the length. There's a way that she's deliberately equally proportioning her ideas into the same number of parts. I she think. gives each section equal weight within the poem yeah. to some extent. Like you're given as much time to think that all it takes to make a prairie is a clover and a bee as you are given to it takes a clover and a bee in reverie. And then you're given just as much time with actually reverie alone will do if bees are few. Each one of those thirds in the poem is given its own similar stresses and statement in terms of time for your attention. And so you, your own understanding as you read through it has enough time to sort of sit with this, take it in. Okay, that's what this is. Sit with the next one. Oh, wait, no, it's this. And then the end part. Oh, wait, no, it's this. And then you can, because it's so short, quickly revisit it, having just gone through all of that, uh, almost like a TV show that has a big twist ending. When you watch it again, knowing that twist ending, you see all these hints and ideas and thoughts that are sort of setting you up for it. Yes, thank you. That was much better put. <laughs> um, the other part too that I like is, I was just looking it over and so the last sort of rhyme is the reverie alone will do if bees are few. So you got that ooh rhyme with do and few. And I was looking it over and I don't think there's any other ooh sound in the poem before then. And so it's a small point, but I think that it's very strategic that she's introducing a new sound completely uh, when she concludes with the last two lines. Um, especially since we are so inundated with the E's and the ers and the airs and the as that um, it helps sell the end by just totally opening up a different sonic register rhyme in the in the last two lines. Definitely. Yeah, it's very cleverly done. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting because a big part of what's going on in this poem, and it's something that comes up kind of often in her poems, is that she'll make almost a declarative statement and then just directly contradict it in the next line. I think it's pretty amazing that she pulls that off basically twice in a poem this short, and it totally works. Yeah. Because you don't feel conflicted about the message you get from the poem. You don't feel like your understanding of what you need for a prairie has been contradicted, but she's told you essentially three different things in <laughs> two sentences over, <laughs> you know, five lines of 27 words. That's, it takes 15 seconds to read this poem. You feel like you got a message from it, but you were told three different things. She manages to make the telling of those three different things into one cohesive, impactful message. And I think that that ability to wield contradiction for a single unified point is pretty astounding. And I can't think of another writer who does it. And she does it in a lot of her poems. This is by far, this is not the only example of it in her work. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, and yeah, she's a, I mean, she's a master of the, of the short form. I mean, there's no one better, except for maybe like haiku masters like Basho or something. Um, but that's a, a one, if you're interested in Dickinson, you should obviously read Dickinson. But one contemporary poet who 
uh, I think is indebted to Dickinson is Kay Ryan, who I really like. And her book, The Best of It, is a selected poems. And she was the US Poet Laureate for some time, a few years ago. But she writes a lot of little poems that like seem like they're sort of like didactic uh, bits of wisdom, but there's like so many little rhymey and co contradictions um, that really echoes a lot of Dickinson. But I, I like, anyway, so plug for Kay Ryan and also Emily Dickinson. But that's a really interesting point about contradiction because there's a question of how in this short of a space do you make something feel big enough to be a unit to stand on itself, to feel like you've had an, an event or an experience or a message. Um, and so I think what we've all been talking about are the ways in which Dickinson has been doing that, the rhyme scheme, the rhythm, the repetition, um, but also the contradiction is a really, contradiction is a really efficient way to like open up space in almost immediate time um, by saying different things you allow for a wider room rather than saying one thing very thoroughly so the gaps made by the contradictions or the resistance to an easy um, one and done that contradictions provide um, make the language larger, I think, so that when you read it, you're like, oh, wow. And that space that it creates, I think, also invites the reader into the poem. Yeah. And if you disagree or your curiosity is piqued by the first statement she makes and then she makes a contradictory statement, the reader is primed to then perk up and say, wait a minute, I thought that it took a bee and a clover, a clover and a bee, now there's this third thing, I better be paying attention because anything could happen. Right, right, because then it, and one, one way that I really like, which I think is, is helpful with Dickinson is, you know, we talk about the poems have speakers, someone is speaking the poem who is probably like a shadow or a, a someone, a doppelganger of Dickinson who's like Dickinson, but not exactly Dickinson. That's like a helpful way to think about it. But then, which is, which I think is a helpful way to think about this when you're like, what kind of person speaks this, like this poem? What kind of person goes out with like a really big claim about how to make a prairie? And it's, you know, it's pretty frugal, you know? And then he restates the claim. She restates the claim, one clover and a bee. And then, oh, as you were doing your imitation, you know, and reverie also, and then, well, oh, you actually just need reverie. I mean, it's funny that the fact, and it, it's worked so well, the other great part is just that reverie is initially added as a throwaway, and reverie, but then reverie becomes the essential thing um, by the end. And when you, when you think about like, what kind of person speaks this or believes this or says this, that that raises a lot of questions about how they're saying it and, and what kind of like assumptions or, or attitudes about life goes into a person who's, who's going to say that. Definitely. And as a speaker, it feels because of that throw away and then double down very conversational, like this person just sort of came upon this understanding themselves as they're telling it to you. It's like, you know, it takes a clover and a bee and reverie you know, <laughs> now that I say that, I'm thinking maybe just the reverie. I, that's a new idea. Have you <laughs> thought of that? I'm, I'm going to say the reverie will do <laughs> if bees are few. If bees are few. If, if like, there's plenty I, I of bees, you you'll use the bees, for God's sake. But if you don't <laughs> have the bees, you use the reverie. That's fine. Right. If you have the simple tools it takes to create something grand, fun fact, simple tools can make grand things. Awesome. But then it's like, you know, even if you don't have those <laughs> tools, if you have the desire to create something big, that's what's really important. It's never going to get done without that desire. That desire is the elemental force beneath even 
the person who picks up the simple tools. Also, um, reverie, great word. It has it fallen is, I, by the wayside. I mean, I go to all these I went, parties. I want to go to a reverie. Yeah, no kidding. I went to my trusty Oxford English Dictionary, actually, because I, Ooh. in a poem this short, to have a word repeated at all is like, you're calling it pretty important. And then to have it be sort of the, the main thrust of the poem is, is real big. So I went and looked up reverie. And aside from one of its four definitions, which is like vulgarity, it's a super out of date definition. It's like vulgar or violent language. Yeah. Um, the three definitions in the OED are one, a state of joy or delight. Yes. Two, a fantastic, fanciful, unpractical or purely theoretical idea or notion oh my god number three a fit of abstracted musing a brown study or daydream number four an emily dickinson poem yeah oh that's 100%. perfect hundred uh, percent fun fact related to this i think about emily dickinson is that she actually trained in botany and was a, an avid gardener and was pretty well known as someone who was super into plants and wrote in her letters to people was like constantly writing about flowers and gardens and stuff and images of flowers and gardens and bees actually show up all over her poetry and work and uh, in large part because this was sort of an area of interest for her. So I think it's no accident that prairies, bees and clovers are the, to some extent metaphor she's using uh, for her her larger point. Yeah, that's interesting. I love that. I that's that's everything I got for now. Do you have anything else or shall we read it again? I think we should read it again. Sounds good. To make a prairie by Emily Dickinson. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee. And reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Those reviews help us with the algorithm and are the best way for us to find new listeners. Do you have thoughts about this poem? Or is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode? We would love to hear from you, and there are tons, tons of ways to get in touch. Yes, you can send us an email to close talking poetry at gmail.com or find us on Twitter. I'm at Jack Rossiter Munn. Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. And the show is at Close Talking. On Instagram, we are at Close Talking Poetry. And we are on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Close Talking. And speaking of all of those many and varied social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China. Woo woo! Woo. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Come back again. Please come back. Just one more time. Door is always open. Okay, bye. Yeah. <laughs>